Good evening. I will begin with a bit of a fable, and there are a number of versions of the story floating around, uh, but the premise is always the same. When shooting Lifeboat, Alfred Hitchcock was asked why after the title music was there to be no score throughout the picture. And he glibly responded by asking the crew, as the story goes, where would the music come from floating in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean? This would be unrealistic. David Raxson, the composer who was currently assigned to the project, uh, not for much longer after that, uh, asked Hitchcock where the camera and the lights would be in the middle of the Atlantic. This brings up some pretty important points about expectations for film audio and uh, film visual content and narrative. And these are usually issues that keep the critical studies people very busy and those in production and in post-production sometimes, uh, sometimes at odds. So as someone who works in uh, music and sound, uh, I, I try to keep my visual contributions to a minimum. And in fact, I think it's safe to say that if you ever see a composer on screen, it's because they've accidentally walked onto a soundstage. Um, that being said, there are many musical elements on the screen uh, or implicitly within the scene and their interaction with other elements, uh, particularly the underscore, can provide filmmakers with power powerful narrative tools, which I think uh, sometimes go underused. I first heard the term diegetic music at a summer seminar at USC in about 2003, and uh, David Bondalevich was giving a talk to young composers at the Zemeckis Center, and he used this term, which was new to all of us, uh, to mean any music coming from within a scene of which the characters are aware. So for example, a radio playing in a bar, performer in a street scene, a gospel choir in a church, that sort of thing, something that is not underscore. And some of the most effective underscore we do take for granted, such as we take for granted the fact that most films we watch involve some sort of visual field and some sort of framing. So the term diegetic music is considered by many filmmakers understandably to be this snobby academic way of saying source music. And that's almost true. I, I, I give it that. And uh, music from an on-screen source. Uh, most people use the terms diegetic music and source music interchangeably. Uh, my sense is they're slightly different, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. What, what can this music accomplish uh, for a scene? And a lot of it is obviously contextual. Uh, diegetic music can locate a scene within a particular time period. Uh, a part of the world, a type of location, and so forth, and it, it adds to the composite uh, believability of the film. Uh, but as with underscore, the level to which this achieves it can range between being right on the nose, which is to say directly supportive of what's going on in the narrative, or it can be more neutral or even ironic. So. Here is a striking example of diegetic music where it's actually at odds with the scene. I use the terms diegetic and source music interchangeably. I do not use them interchangeably for a couple of reasons. And uh, first I found that uh, working in music copyright, uh, people confuse source music with found music. Uh, and found music is usually meaning a popular song that's been licensed for the particular film. It'll show up yeah, on the soundtrack uh, release and, and so forth. Sometimes it's used in the fashion of underscore. Um, 
Second, I think actually diegetic is a broader term than source music. And to me, source music describes really something that's on screen or very tactile, but is implicitly, uh, implicitly there, even if it's uh, off the screen. So uh, what I mean by that is uh, like a, if you're in a store, you're in a department store, there's a speaker on the roof. That doesn't need to be in the frame, but you hear this you know, horrible music through the, you know, through, through the scene. Um, you don't see it, but you know it's there, and you know you have a pretty good idea that it's it's physically there too. So, um, but what if you want to imply something or subtly refer to something in a way that you can't do just visually? Something, uh, for example, that's typically played in uh, such an area that a, a, a character could hear if they were there but they're not actually there in that physical space at the same time. So like someone recalling the sound of their dead grandfather singing to them or imagining a school dance happening without them there, you know, ha happy things really. But um, uh, this, this kind of music, it, it can come from a memory or an association uh, with something that's completely different from what the character is literally doing on screen at the same time. Uh, so in that sense, it's not really source music, and it's not really underscore either. It, 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 falls, it falls in a very strange area. And this is something that the theorist and musicologist Robin Stilwell describes as the fantastical gap between diegetic and non-diegetic music. And with this, there's a suspension of disbelief like there is in most, uh, in most film, in most opera, in most uh, theater, right? anytime you're watching something, really. Um, and music functions um, not uh, just as a commentary as it would in an underscore, uh, and not in just a utilitarian way as it does in the source music. So what if a composer could manipulate the audience by writing music in, um, in such a way that its source and relation to the narrative was a little bit more amorphous, and music that moves between diegetic and underscore several times even within the same scene? And uh, what if this phenomenon were considered uh, more of a uh, fundamental tool for filmmakers to use rather than a, uh, a rarity? Uh, so um, I, as a composer, this is what interests me the most, this sort of trans-diegetic music, um, the technical considerations that have to uh, be accounted for when creating this and the um, intensity that it can cause. Uh, that it can provide uh, filmmakers uh, in constructing their narrative. So let's take this uh, famous scene from Casablanca. agree that at some point the music shifts between Sam's piano playing in Rick's Cafe and this underscore, this, uh, you know, very uh, late romantic underscore, a large studio orchestra, you know, thousands of people, not, not really, but um, you, you have the sense is an incredibly different sonic field than you have in, a, uh, in Rick's Cafe. Um, so where does this transition occur exactly? How does it begin? And what are some of the technical ways that this, uh, this may have been achieved? So <clears throat> uh, we'll watch it again, part of it again. And uh, how about uh, raise your hand when you think the music begins to move from diegetic music uh, to non-diegetic music. When does it become the underscore?
we're split uh, approximately 50-50 here. Um, and um, so that's very interesting, actually, where, where the hands came up. Let's watch it now again um, with just the visuals, no audio. And uh, please raise your hands. Maybe at the same time, maybe not. At the same time, be very honest. So when does this shift occur? All right, I'm, I was the last one to raise my hand, and that was, that was a little tongue-in-cheek. It was interesting to see where the, the director and the cinematographer raise their hands at very different times. Uh, a, a musician has a different feeling, another musician has a different feeling, perhaps. Um, so that's actually not what I was expecting. I was actually expecting this, this transitional time to be a little bit more condensed. And it's interesting, actually, now that, that in listening to the music, um, uh, actually, you're a little closer together. That's, that's interesting. So, speaking of which, let's listen entirely uh, to the audio. Uh, no visuals, sorry. And um, let's see if it's easier or harder to tell. So, uh, same sort of thing. Go ahead and raise your hand. So I saw some, some very tentative hands, and then I saw some hands come up and come down and, and come back up again. Now, that's, that's wonderful. That's really wonderful because what that means is that in that period, especially those of you who were indecisive, you, you may be with, uh, experiencing that fantastical gap between diegetic music and non-diegetic music. Uh, uh, my sense of it is actually that the transition begins right when the strings enter. And um, my rationale for this, although we do see some dance bands in Rick's Cafe um, during the day, it's highly unlikely that a 50-person you know, string section could sneak in there in the middle of a Nazi lockdown, right? Uh, and then suddenly start accompanying Sam in the, in, you know, in the middle. They're not implicitly just off screen. It's something else. It's transforming into something else. So for me, uh, as a uh, conductor, you know, orchestra, composer, what, what have you, for me hearing that color uh, is, is when, the, when that change really begins. Um, so they also, I think, amplify the intensity of the piano and they don't detract from it. And um, this is both emotional and, uh, and acoustic, and we can, um, we can see this actually just a little more, uh, a little more closely. So this will be a little repetitious for a moment. can see that right here is where the strings come in. Right around here in this range, suddenly for the very first time, we have this, so this is, here's our frequency. Um, we have some very strong, we can hear that these are the fundamental pitches, da da -de, that you get in the violas right here. But you can also see that they align with something else and there's this frequency band here that continues. 
And then the next chords come in, and the, uh, the higher strings actually come in right here too. So you can actually see looking at this uh, spectrogram uh, when, when, this, when this actual moment occurs. Um, so obviously left to right is time as time goes by. And uh, <laughs> so sorry. And, um, and then here, here are our frequencies. Now unlike a waveform, Amplitude is not shown by a jagged line. Amplitude is shown by the intensity of color here. So the closer you get to white, the louder it is. So you can see that we add these here. And you can see actually these blocks. Each time the note changes in the accompaniment underneath, you can see it here. This is actually what the music looks like. This is taken from uh, Max Steiner's suite that's performed in concert a lot, but it's actually lifted. This is, this is, I believe, identical to what we have in this cue here. So the piano is playing, and then we get the viola entrances, and then the cellos enter half bar later. Um, so uh, that is that. Now, on a practical level, for those concerned with this kind of thing, a number of people had to be involved uh, with this. Um, this should give you a sense. These people were just principals dealing with this, tr just this transition to the flashback on a musical level. This doesn't include the crew. This doesn't include anybody involved with purely visual aspects. I left off the DP, I'm very sorry. Uh, the, the, doesn't include the orchestra, the engineers, or most of the music preparation services. So it's an effort. And uh, there, there's a wonderful article uh, that outlines, and they investigated some of the, uh, the history of this, mostly through payroll records. The number of days this took to record, when they were recording it, who was in the room, who was, who was paid to be there. Uh, and uh, it, it gives you a sense of, of uh, this. Um, in fact, they, uh, they spent one day shooting uh, this scene with, um, with the pianist, with a um, uh, uh, plumber there off screen playing uh, for Sam, playing for Dooley Wilson. And, um, and they, they recorded that. And then for some reason, the next day, I believe, they showed up with 40 minutes of synchronized uh, highly synchronized playback music, and uh, and then they reshot. So a lot of a lot of time spent in this. A lot of things that I think are uh, could be baffling, um, uh, but having to do really with synchronizing the thing that is conceived in someone's mind uh, as to how the sound works together and how it is actually realized uh, in production. And this was actually about two weeks before the composer was hired. This brings me to, um, to my final point, and related to that really is that um, there are a few main ways that filmmakers and composers can discuss this kind of thing and, and can conceive moving back and forth between diegetic and non-diegetic music. And they're fairly self-explanatory concepts, but they do require a lot of tinkering and fussing and testing to get right. These are pretty apparent. Uh, the word scores, many of you have probably come into contact with, uh, uh, you know, it means transdiegetic music, music that's, that's uh, you know, it's, we've heard here is both diegetic and underscore. Um, it's, a, it's, an, it's a fun term. Uh, anyhow, um, and it's also, in addition to these being fairly straightforward things to think about, there are also ways that we can do this in a fairly straightforward fashion. It's really not that hard in some ways to do it. So how do you make something that's musical move from the foreground, from the, uh, the surround, the gazamt? Uh, how, do you, how, do you, um, how do you make something that's score, uh, that's underscore? How do you put it on screen? What are things you can do? And, and the easiest things you can do are change the volume, change the EQ, and change 
the spatialization. So for something like Casablanca, it was recorded monophonically, and and in the you know the video releases now that we have, it's it's double mono to create this stereo, right? So we don't actually we we don't have a, a um, an audio field really to play with uh, play with there. Um, but since the 70s, and since uh, actually a little before that, since spatialization became much more possible, uh, now that's another parameter we have too. So just to illustrate these for fun, I'll leave you with two very different clips. Uh, one of them has been altered from its original state, and the other is uh, just as it stands in the film. And uh, Aaron, I apologize in advance for ruining Star Wars. All right, it's almost a comedy. She looks like she smelled something bad, right? None of the music was actually altered. It was just re-spaced. The volume was changed. It was EQ'd. Um, I don't know. I, I'm still standing, so it wasn't that, that bad. Um, and uh, and uh, one more. So I really hope that Alfred Hitchcock saw that before he died. Uh, it would make a floating orchestra in the Atlantic at least uh, a little less far-fetched after all. So thank you very much.